Now, uh, today our subject, we're going to be continuing, since we're live streaming, we're continuing our series on the eight laws of health. Now, for some of you who may not know where we are in the series, I want to tell you the series is based on uh, this statement here. This is the springboard for our series on the eight laws of health. It comes from a book called The Ministry of Healing. And the statement says, pure air, sunlight, <coughs> abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power, these are the true remedies. Now, we have an acronym that we are using to help us remember these eight laws. Can anybody tell me what that acronym is? Very good. New start. Well, before we review that, let's pray and ask God to be with us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have every single day to make a new start with you. I want to thank you that you are willing to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, now as we look at the subject of health and how to have a new start in our health, pray that you would be with us, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now in the New Start acronym, the N stands for nutrition. That's important. We talked about that. The E stands for exercise. The W, S, sunlight. We could use a lot more of that in Michigan right now, couldn't we? I'm like, where is the sun? It just needs to come out and dry up this, all this mud. T stands for temperance. A stands for air. R stands for and the final T, trust in divine power. Now, my subject is not rest today, so you don't get to take a nap while I preach. Our subject is the one called air. Now, last time we talked about temperance and the temperance beer company. We know we talked about all that. Well, this time our subject is air. It was April 16 of the year 1875. The place... Paris, France. For more than two years, three scientists had worked toward this day, and now they were ready. Carefully, they climbed into the gondola of the balloon Zenith, while thousands around them watched below. Determined to set a new altitude record, they wanted to go higher than man had ever risen above the earth before. And they did just that. But at what a cost. Before the day was over, it would be called the balloon ride of death. The three men aboard were Gaston Tissandier, Joseph Croce Spinelli, and Theodore Seville. In a scenario reminiscent of a horror movie, the three of them attempted to ascend into the heavens from Paris on that April day, but only one would come down alive, and he would be forever damaged by the experience. Slowly, the large balloon rose into the air with its human cargo of three men in a basket-shaped gondola just swinging below the balloon. All seemed well. They were well on their way toward the goal to climb higher and higher than any man had ever gone before. Now they had along with them a supply of bagged oxygen for when the air would get too thin. At 24,430 feet, it happened. To Sandier, one of the three later described it. Croche is grasping for breath. Seville is dazed, but can still cut three sandbags loose in order to reach 26,240 feet. Unfortunately, we don't really know what happened for sure, but it seems that all three aviators were overwhelmed by the thinness of the air before they were able to properly get to their oxygen. At that point, Tissandier himself was overcome and slumped to the floor, losing consciousness. Sometime afterward, as the balloon, freed from the sandbags, continued its ascent, that's when Tissandier awoke. They had attained a height of 28,000 feet. But two of the scientists lay dead in the gondola. Yes, they had conquered the heights, but before they were done, the heights had conquered them. There was not enough air with its precious, life-giving oxygen to sustain life at that great altitude. Without air, humans die. Air is the most vital element for man and animals. Scientists say that 
a person can live without food for about four to ten weeks, depending on their physical condition. They can live without water for three to ten days, depending on the person and the environment. But usually, a person can only survive three minutes without air. Although there have been those who, after years of training, can hold their breath for five minutes while driving. But most of us, three minutes without air, and we're done. Open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Genesis chapter 1, first chapter of the Bible, beginning in verse 6. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Now the heaven mentioned here, being created by God on the second day, refers to the atmospheric heaven or the sky that we see. It includes the air we breathe and upon which life on earth depends. Now that is the record of creation, how we have the air that we breathe. Before God created this planet, from what we can understand from reading the Genesis account, our planet was one big ball of water, one big planet of water. And the Bible says that the earth at that time was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. On the first day, God created light. And on the second day, the Bible says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. So the work of the second day of creation consisted of creating or forming the firmament. Now this great mass of primeval waters was divided into two separate bodies. The waters which were above the firmament, verse 7, are generally considered by commentators to be a water vapor. The water below the firmament, of course, was water, groundwater on the earth. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Now in the Hebrew Bible, as well as in the modern translation, the word heaven is the name given by both to the place where God lives and the sky where the birds fly. In this verse, heaven refers to the atmospheric heavens that when we look up, appear to us as if it were a dome of vaulting our earth. It's generally called the sky. So the firmament described in Genesis today is a 12-mile thick layer wrapped around our planet. The atmosphere consists of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, helium, carbon dioxide, and other gases. The average adult human breathes between 16 to 20 times per minute, taking in about two gallons of air per minute. That would be a total of 2,900 gallons of air per day that we breathe. Of course, if you were exercising, you would take in a lot more than that. For example, here's a chart here. An adult male running at five miles per hour would be taking in about 50 liters of air per minute. That's about 13 gallons of air a minute right there, for those of you who can't do the conversions. I'm from Canada, so it's, you know, we use liters and stuff up there. Now, the air we exhale contains 21% oxygen. Pardon me, the air we inhale, 21%, and the air we exhale contains 16% oxygen. So you see, our lungs collect oxygen out of the air that we breathe. That tells us that when you breathe in, you consume about 5% of the oxygen out of the air. Your body uses that oxygen to um, you know, sustain the body, of course, and in the process creates carbon dioxide. 
you see the percentage of carbon dioxide from a very small amount of inhaled air comes to a quite large amount in the exhaled air. A human being uses about 145 gallons of pure oxygen a day. You could look at it this way. Our human bodies consume oxygen and emit carbon dioxide as exhaust. The lungs add life-giving oxygen to the bloodstream where it is taken to the extremities of your body. Your lungs also remove carbon dioxide from the blood stream, which is then exhaled. Here's how it works. Your body has two lungs. On the right side of your chest and on the left side. Now, the left lung is slightly smaller to make room for your heart. Your lungs are essentially spongy organs that are optimized for gas exchange from air to your blood and from blood to the air. Each lung is made up of sections called lobes. The purpose of the lungs is to bring oxygen into the body and to remove carbon dioxide from your body. The lungs are a very soft, sensitive organ. That's why they are protected by your rib cage. But how do your lungs protect themselves from airborne pollutants? First, your nose acts as a filter when breathing in, preventing large particles of pollutants from entering your lungs. If an irritant does enter your lung, it will get stuck in a thin layer of mucus or phlegm that lines the inside of your breathing tubes. An average of three ounces of mucus are secreted into the lining of these breathing tubes every day. The mucus then is swept up toward the mouth by little hairs that line your breathing tube called cilia. Cilia move mucus from the lungs upward toward the throat. Now, if that isn't amazing, I don't know what is. Now, another protective mechanism for the lungs is the cough. Now, a cough is a very common event, but it is not a normal event. It means that something is irritating the bronchial tubes. Now, a cough can expel mucus from the lungs way faster than the cilia. Those little hairs can can take it out. In fact, if you cough, I mean, you can sometimes see how far people project when they cough if there's a lot of spittle coming up with it, for lack of a better word. So to deliver oxygen to the body, air is breathed in through the nose, mouth, or both. The nose is the preferred route because it gets filtered better than if you breathe through your mouth. The nose decreases the amount of irritants delivered to the lungs while also heating and moisturizing the air that you breathe. Of course, when large amounts of air are needed, The nose is not the most efficient way of getting it down there. That's why we can also breathe through our mouth. Mouth breathing is commonly needed when you're working hard or you're exercising. However, the vast majority of time when you breathe, you breathe through your nose. And in that case, the air is filtered, it's heated, and it's moisturized. I want to tell you, friend, there is not a chance on earth that all came about by a series of random chances in evolution. This to me is clear evidence of a creator God who made us in the beginning. Now after entering the nose or mouth, air travels down the trachea or windpipe. Now the trachea is the tube lying closest to the front of your neck. Behind the trachea is another tube. Anybody can tell me what that is? That's right, the esophagus. And what is the esophagus for? Getting your food down into your stomach, right? Now, the path the air and the food take is controlled by the epiglottis. That is a gate that prevents the food from entering the trachea. Now, occasionally, food or liquid may enter the trachea, resulting in choking or coughing spasms. That's never happened to anyone here, has it? Now, the trachea divides into a left and a right breathing tube, and these are termed bronchi. The left bronchus leads to the left lung, and the right bronchus leads to the right lung. 
these breathing tubes continue to divide into smaller and smaller tubes called bronchioles. These bronchioles are as thin as a strand of hair. The bronchioles end in tiny air sacs called alveoli. Alveoli, which means bunch of grapes in Italian, looks like a cluster of grapes attached to tiny breathing tubes. So here is a uh, picture here, and uh, you can see, or you can't see the alveoli, but you can see these tiny strands, how as your breathing tube just gets, keeps branching out, gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it ends in the alveoli. Now, if the alveoli were opened and laid flat out, they would cover the area of a doubles tennis court. There are over 300 million alveoli in normal lungs. I want to talk for a moment about the alveoli. That is where the rubber meets the road. They are the functional unit of the lungs that permit gas exchange. Remember the oxygen carbon dioxide thing? That happens in the alveoli. That's where that action takes place. Each alveoli is a hollow cup-shaped cavity surrounded by many tiny capillaries that of course are filled with blood. With each inhalation, by the way, even that is complicated, in order to inhale, your body has to create negative pressure inside your lungs. How does it do it? Muscles surrounding the lungs, such as the diaphragm, the abdominal muscles, expand and contract in order to change the volume of the inner chest cavity to create that negative air pressure. Isn't that incredible how that works? Marvelous. So each time you inhale, air fills a large portion of the millions of alveoli. In a process called diffusion, oxygen moves from the alveoli to the blood through the capillaries those tiny blood vessels that line the alveolar walls. Once in the bloodstream, oxygen gets picked up by a molecule called hemoglobin in the red blood cells. The oxygen-rich blood then flows back to the heart, which pumps it through the arteries to oxygen-hungry tissues throughout the body. In the tiny capillaries of the body tissue, oxygen is freed from the hemoglobin and moves into the cells. Carbon dioxide, which is produced during the process of diffusion, moves out of these cells and into the capillaries where most of it is dissolved in the plasma of the blood. Blood then, rich in carbon dioxide, returns to the heart via the veins. From the heart, the blood is pumped into the lungs where carbon dioxide passes into the alveoli to be exhaled. It's all pretty complicated, but it's like a big shipping business goes in a big circle. As we've seen, the process of breathing really, at the bottom line, is getting oxygen into our bodies, to our cells, all over our bodies, and also getting the carbon dioxide out. And it is one of the most crucial aspects to life. Many people, when they talk about health, they talk about exercise, and that's all fine and good. They talk about diet, and that's fine and good too. But there is a reason why many consider that air is one of the eight laws of health. It just might be one of the most important ones to survival. Oh, you say, well, that may be well and true, but that happens automatically. How could a person forget to breathe, right? Well, I think it deserves more attention than at first glance. Talk about air quality for a moment. If you are breathing polluted air, it is not good for your lungs. In fact, there are many places in the world today where smog is so thick that it's actually hazardous to your health. Unfortunately, this is a big problem in the big cities and in some other areas. If anybody here has ever traveled to India or China or California, I'm serious. I used to live in California. I lived in Bakersfield, California. Bakersfield is called the armpit of California because all the smog from all the cities south of it come up, the wind blows them, and the mountains keep the smog right there. So not that much smog is produced by Bakersfield itself, but it accumulates from all the other cities. And I kid you not, in the summertime, maybe it's improved since I moved away in 2009, but I doubt it, it is thick with smog. You can't even see the sky. You can't see into the distance. That is not healthy for your lungs. 
uh, heating units, power plants, incinerators, industry are a major part of air pollution. Um, but they say that the number one cause is vehicular exhaust. Of course, you have jet airplanes in the midst, you have trains, you have buses, cars, and they have revolutionized our society, but they've come at a price. And that is the reduction of air quality. Now, I am not a tree hugger, so don't, don't put me in that political bandwagon or anything like that. But anybody who has lived in a place with smog knows that it's not pleasant and is not good for your health. Some people, when they move away from California, they joke that they're concerned because they can't see what they're breathing. Michigan, we're very fortunate here. We have very clean, pure air to breathe, at least up here in Saginaw so far in this area. Now, when we're talking about outdoor air quality, um, if you're working in dusty conditions or you're working in chemicals, it is important to wear proper masks and respirators for that situation. You don't want to get that stuff in your lungs. Think about it. When God created us, he didn't mean for us to be grinding up concrete and spraying chemicals at 100 PSI. So it's responsible that we take proper precautionary measures to take care of our lungs. I'll give you an example. I went up into my attic to look around there. And I was only up there for about 10 minutes. And when I came down, guess what? I was coughing and sputtering. Why is that? What's in my attic? Insulation, right? So now when I go up there, I wear a mask. And when I come down, I have no side effects. So just when you're working, think about that. Your lungs are important and you don't want to damage them. Let's use common sense. Let's keep that stuff out of our lungs. I'm not talking about your eyes now, but since I'm talking about protective equipment, I just bought myself a uh, air nailer this week. And I'm so thrilled and I'm so excited about that because it just blasts in nails like no one's business. So, you know, just pounds them right into hardwood. I can't believe it. But it's important. I actually have, if you look at my glasses, a uh, dent in my glasses where a nail uh, glanced off and hit my glasses. Tell you what, I was thankful I was wearing glasses. This was not this week. This was with a borrowed air nailer some time ago. But that experience taught me that when I'm using my air nailer, what I, I ought to put safety glasses on. I'm not going to trust my, my glasses. Because all it takes is one nail just to bounce off or ricochet, and uh, you could lose an eye. But think about your lungs. Let's use common sense. I want to talk for a moment about indoor air quality. You may not be able to control what's out there in the big cities. Um, in Michigan, there's not too much of a problem at this point. But your indoor air quality might be very poor. Um, I once lived in a home that, unbeknown to me, had mold in the walls. That cr can create poor indoor air quality. I was always sick. I was always coughing and sneezing and had, you know, sinus congestion. When I moved out of that house, guess what? All of those problems subsided. Indoor air quality. And we're talking about indoor air quality. It's a great opportunity to remind you to have working smoke detectors in your homes. Most people who die in home fires do not die of being burned to death. They die of smoke inhalation. A working smoke detector can save your life and the lives of those that you love. And when I go camping, you know, your RV that's been sitting all year, likely the battery is dead in that smoke detector. And probably your RV is a lot more likely to burn down than your house. <laughs> the way those furnaces work and wiring and mice chewing on it all year, you understand? So make sure your smoke detectors work. There should be about one in every uh, room of the house that you're sleeping in. I believe that's what code suggests. It's also a good idea to have a carbon monoxide detector, especially if you have uh, things in your home like propane dryers, furnaces, and fireplaces, and stoves, things that run on gas. There were several unfortunate deaths a few years back right here in Michigan. Uh, we had a huge ice storm that knocked out the power for about seven days. Uh, this was, I think, 2014, if I recall. I can't remember the exact year, but the power was out for over, over a week. And unfortunately, several people lost their lives from carbon monoxide poisoning running generators in an enclosed area. 
I actually know someone personally who almost died of working in a garage with a generator running. He thought it was fine because the generator was right next to an open door. But apparently, he was not fine. He almost died. So back to indoor air quality. Smoking, for instance. Well, that's a double problem. First, it harms your lungs. And second, it reduces the air quality in the home. Smoking destroys the tiny hairs known as cilia that line the upper airways to protect against infection. Normally, your airways have a thin layer of mucus and thousands of cilia. The mucus traps the tiny particles of dirt and pollution you breathe in while the thousands of cilia move like a wave to push that dirty mucus out of your lungs. We talked about that already. But here's what happens. Smoking destroys the cilia. And along with the chemicals, it also harms your lungs. And this gunk in your lungs can put you at risk for developing cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD, chest infections, and chronic cough. Smoking also damages the alveoli or air sacs in the lungs, which can eventually make it difficult to breathe. The alveoli at the end of your airways are like little stretchy balloons. And when you smoke, the alveoli become less stretchy. It's more difficult for your body to exchange oxygen and take out the carbon dioxide. As alveoli are destroyed, the lungs transfer less and less oxygen to the bloodstream. Smoking is not only harmful for the smoker, but also for others who live in the home. Another reason for poor air quality might be the way we heat our homes. Wood stoves are great because we all love wood heat. I do as well. But I want you to think about any form of combustion reduces the amount of oxygen in your home. So if you have combustion in your home, it is a good idea to have that combustion connected to a fresh air inlet. So you're not using up the oxygen in your home. Unless your home is so old and drafty, you're getting oxygen anyways. But people nowadays want a home that's all sealed up with double insulation and sealed tight windows, and they're not getting that oxygen exchange into their homes. Your home needs a constant supply of fresh, invigorating air. Stale air is not healthy. It's a big deal because our body depends on getting fresh air. Notice just a few statements from health educators uh, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, This is from Second Selected Messages, page 473. The health of the entire system depends upon the healthy action of the respiratory organs. Ministry of Healing, page 272. In order to have a good blood, we must breathe well. Full, deep inspirations of pure air which fill the lungs with oxygen, purify the blood, and send it a life-giving current to every part of the body. Now, these statements are in perfect harmony with what we've learned of the functions of the lungs. Here's another one. Let there be a current of air and an abundance of light in every room in the house. Sleeping rooms should be so arranged as to have a free circulation of air day and night. No room is fit to be occupied as a sleeping room unless it can be thrown open daily to the air and sunshine. So we see it's important that our homes are well ventilated. In fact, hospital systems, they know this is important and they have air exchangers that replace the air every so many hours in a hospital. This is what they have. We don't can't afford these systems in our homes, but what you can afford to do is open the windows. Bring some of that fresh, pure air in. When the day is sunny and warm, take the bedding out. Hang it, hang it on the clothesline. Let it air out. The purifying air and the sunlight will do much to sterilize it. Bring it back into the home before the dampness of the evening sets in, and you will notice if you do that, the comforter that you hung out on the clothesline will smell so fresh when you bring it in. So fresh, incredible. In fact, can you tell the difference? I can. If a window has been opened in a bedroom, letting it air out, can you tell the difference when you walk in there? I sure can. Um, It smells so fresh afterward. Fresh air has so many proven benefits. Here are just a few. Fresh air is good for the digestion, helps you digest your food more effectively. That's why it's great to take a walk outside after you eat. It improves your blood pressure and your heart rate, makes a person happier. Uh, The amount of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter in your brain, in your system is affected by the amount of oxygen that you inhale. The amount of serotonin can lighten your mood and promote a sense of happiness and well-being. Fresh air will leave you relaxed and refreshed. 
Fresh air strengthens the immune system. White blood cells kill and fight bacteria and germs, and they need a good supply of oxygen to do their work. Fresh air cleans your lungs. It helps the airways of your lungs to dilate more fully and improves the cleansing action of your lungs. When you exhale and breathe out through your lungs, you release airborne toxins away from your body. And you will have more energy and a sharper mind if you get fresh air. Why is that? Because of your body, your brain uses 20% of the oxygen that your body brings in. So it's important for proper brain function. Now, to get fresh air into your system, to get oxygen into your system, deep breathing and proper breathing techniques are important. If possible, breathe through your nose so the air is filtered, heated, and moisturized. Even proper posture is important. If you're always hunched over and you're walking this way, it's hard for your lungs to fill up. Now, if you're wearing clothing that is restricting your lower chest or your stomach, it gives the lungs less room to expand. Here is a good habit, one that will probably greatly impact your life. And by the way, breathing exercises, you've heard of them before. They're in many different styles of medicine. They're important. A good habit is to go outside in the fresh air and take between 1 and 20 slow, deep abdominal breaths after each meal or just before going to bed. What you do is you slowly breathe all the way in until you can't hold any more, and then all the way out. You can do this between 1 and 20 times. And as you're doing that, you can give thanks to the Creator God, the Lord who created the heavens and the earth and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth, who gives breath to the people on it. You can remember the one who gives to life to all and breath to all things. I want you to imagine God creating Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I imagine at creation, God had just formed the respiratory system. He'd made the ribs, the lungs, the trachea. He'd placed the thousands of cilia, the millions of alveoli, and the capillaries, and he wanted to see it work. So the Bible says that he bent down and he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Every breath we take, my friends, is a gift from the Creator, just as much as that first breath was. The Bible says He gives to all life, breath, and all things. And the question I have for you this morning, or this afternoon by four minutes now, what are you doing with the breath that God has given you. Job said, this is Job 27, verse 3 and 4, as long as, my, as long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. What are you doing with the breath God has given you? Are you glorifying God? Are you praising God? Does your life glorify God? Or will it be said of you as it was Tragically, said of King Belshazzar so long ago, you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways. You have not glorified. No one knows when God who breathed into Adam's nostrils in the beginning, will take that breath away. He holds your breath in his hands. No one knows when they will breathe their last. But with Job, I want to say, as long as the breath of God is in me, as long as the breath of God is in my nostrils, I will serve him, I will love him, and I will glorify him. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for the breath that you've given us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't follow in the footsteps of Belshazzar and not recognize the one who has given us life. But with Job, may we glorify you. May we speak of you. May we praise you as long as we have breath. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. And when you take that breath away, 
May our lives have been a testament of what you wanted them to be. May we be ready at any time to breathe our last. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.